Hello. Hi. Hi, Jay. Hello. You can be muted. I was muted. I'm okay. <laughs> now I can hear you. This is my friend Maya. She's going to be helping run the program. Hi. Okay. Hi. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Um. Awesome. Okay, I'll show you. Here is your PowerPoint, Jay. Can you see that? Yep. Looks good? Yeah. Perfect. You want me to control the PowerPoint from here? That will work. I think we, you're, um, you'll tell me when to switch slides. Okay. But I'll see the ones on the left. Um, you can if that helps you. Yeah, well, then I won't have to make any kind of references. I'll know approximately where I am. And okay. I'll tell you the next slide. I can leave it just like this then. Fantastic. Awesome. And then the question is, are we able to hear these? Tell me if you can hear this. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My yeah, I can hear. Ah, it works. That's exciting. Yay. I'm okay. sorry, I didn't hear what happened. <laughs> I'll, I'll be showing a video, and I wanted to make sure that works, too. Okay. Okay, I think that's everything we're screen sharing. Yeah. Do you have any other questions, or do you want to go over anything? No, I think we'll be good. Great. Um, okay. I think we're set up. We did it. Oh, Jay, something very important. Okay. Is that we, the call will cut off at seven o'clock. Um, so we have, there's like 15 minutes of programming after your speech. So are you able to be concluded at 645? Like 6.10 to 6.45 total? Well, where do you want me to stop? Just give me a stopping point and I'll make sure that I get there. Um, You're supposed to do part of the program, aren't you? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so I, I, I'm on first. Yes, we're doing an introduction and then there's a violin piece and then you're going. Okay, so when do, give me a time frame that you want me to stop. Maya, how long do we want for questions? I don't care. Um, as many, we don't as even long need as people questions. have questions, I can answer them. If we're limited for time, like we can just not have questions if we... Um, if we can have questions in between if you want. Whenever somebody has a question, if you want them to answer, to ask, they can ask and we can answer it at time. When I do it in school, I let them ask, ask questions as I speak because they remember them at that time. Now, it's up to you as to how far you want me to go, when you want me to stop. You've seen my PowerPoint. You know how many slides there are. I've already cut some of my... But I can keep, I'm not going to, you know, I can abbreviate what I have to and we'll just skip some slides if necessary. So how about the speech from 6.10 to 6.35 and then questions after for 5 to 10 minutes? That's fine. So you want me to stop 6.45? 6.35. 6.35. 6.35. Six thirty-five. Okay. And then we'll have five or so minutes for questions. Mm -hmm.
hopefully people get on like right when we can start. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna run to the bathroom. Okay. <laughs> And what time do you want me to start? Um, I think she said 6.10. Okay, so it's 25 minutes. Yeah, for speaking, if that's fine with you. Okay. Well, I'm trying to figure out if I should stay. Yeah, that'll work. Yeah, that's that, great. That looks good. I love your tie, Jay. That's why I wore it. <laughs> <laughs> that looks really great. It has a message. It does. Yeah, a wrench. Do you want to tell Maya what that message is? I yeah, love to hear. That wrench saved my life. Oh, interesting. My That's father told him Germans he was a mechanic, but he was a lawyer. They oh. killed the lawyers, so they took him to the airport to fix a vehicle, and he didn't know anything about fixing it, so or what kind of tool to ask for, so he went in the shop and asked him for an adjustable wrench, and he was able to fix the vehicle, and that saved his life and made him the shop foreman. That's amazing. <laughs> So cool how it's such like a seemingly insignificant object. Yeah, well, we're going to have to go kind of fast. I normally spend some time explaining the wrench, but we're not going to have time to do it. So we're just going to, that's why I wore the wrench and just, we're going to get into it fast and leave it. And I wish we could have, I would listen to your stories for three hours if I could. Um, but it's, the technology is stopping us. I understand. And if this were in our control, too, we would have an hour and a half or so, but because I, the I know people, has the... people got to move on with their lives. Sadly. In the classroom, I have the whole hour or the auditorium, I have an hour and a half. But uh, that's in school because that's part of the curriculum. And it's good that it is. Yeah. Took some time to get it in there, but it's there. I've got people from out of town, schools from out of town and homeschoolers that come with the parents and all to my classroom that I've got in the house. But yeah, this, yeah. this year we had to cancel a couple of them because kids are out of school, but the teachers are coming. Wow. You showed me your great library last time I was there. Oh, it's gotten bigger. <laughs> I had to find one of the books today and my librarian moved it away from where I was accustomed to finding it. And I had to go book by book. I also have the complete library of the uh, complete set of books of the Nuremberg trials. Oh, wow. They were sent to me by the New York library. They digitalized and called me up and wanted to know if I wanted the books and they gave me the whole set of books. Wow. Did you ever imagine something like Zoom would exist? Well, did I imagine what? Something like Zoom would exist. <laughs> <laughs> not at my age, not when I started. It's a good thing I've got my grandson living across the street because he's a computer expert. It took me a couple of lessons to get into Zoom. Now that I know how to get into it, I'm Zooming. <laughs> You're Zooming. <laughs> I've been going to virtual synagogue. Well, you saw me on the synagogue when we had the synagogue on uh, Zoom. 
and uh, I, I logged into it. Uh, I learned how to do that. So for class service, I've been able to get on Zoom. Maya, if I say in security participants can't chat, wait, can you, can you go to the chat and see what it happens? It says disabled. So that makes it so you can't text anyone? Anyone. Now it's everyone. How do I make it? Oh, participants can chat with host only. There we go. Okay, so all the questions will go to you. Can I make you a co-host? Yes. Aha. Are you checking to see how many people have registered? No, just three of us right now. No, oh, I, I can let people in from the waiting room if you want to say hi a bit early. That's fine. Let them in. That's oh, let them in. admit people too. I don't know any of these people. Do I have to know them to let them in? I think I'll admit people because I know them. Okay. That's my mom. There's. <laughs> oh, oh, Alex. Oh, Alex. <laughs> hi, Alex. I don't think he can hear you. Alex? No, he can't hear you. I don't think. They might have muted. They have, have you guys got him muted? No, I think he has to connect his audio. I think your mother was muted too, wasn't she? Yes, she was there too. Hi, guys. Hi. I'll call Alex. Claudia, text me if you need to do anything like that, okay? Okay. Well, I'm going to sit down until we get ready for the lecture. <laughs> There you go. Now hang up your phone. Okay. Bye. Bye. Alex, can you hear us? Yes, I can even see you, Jay. Oh my goodness, you better put some dog glasses on. <laughs> you, you got shorter. I thought you were taller than that. <laughs> I'm on my knees praying for a good session. <laughs> That's a good way to do it. You're prepared. You don't have to pray. It's going to come off well. Oh, thank you. Calvin, isn't it? Yeah. Rebecca. Yes. Are you there? I see you. We see you. Can we you? can't hear you. <laughs> you can't you can't hear Rebecca? Yeah, no, yeah, we no, got no, you now. We, we got you now. Okay. I just I wasn't talking. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure if you if you were actually on, I could see your face, but I didn't know if you were actually on. Hear us. I can. Great. Nice to see you. Thanks nice. for joining us. Yes, it was uh, due to Claudia. <laughs> we were working on Yom HaZikaron already next week. She said, before next week, there's Yom HaShoah on Tuesday. So I jumped in. <laughs> Thank you, Claudia. Thank you for coming. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, I spent most of the day today watching from Israel Yom HaShoah and from the Washington Museum Yom HaShoah. There were about four different programs and caught a little bit here and there. Me too. While I was at while I was working, I put on the calling uh, calling of the names. The uh, Hebrew Day School in Northern Virginia graduating seniors uh -huh. did a uh, reading the names. So I had that on all day today. <laughs> <laughs> Even though we're quarantined, we're still working. I think she muted it. Good. Now, if anybody coughs, I'm ready. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
You got your gloves on? Well, you know, I, I found some gloves at 7-Eleven, believe it or not. And they had all these boxes of large gloves. I said, large gloves will fit me these three fingers. So she went in the back and got me some really big ones. We got somebody else in. Hi, I'm Marissa. Hello, Marissa. Hi, Marissa. Hi, Claudia. <laughs> Beck, I see Winston at the end of your name. Is that where you're from or is that your part of your hyphenated name? It's part of, that's my hyphenated name. It's my husband's last name. Oh, okay. And when we moved to Richmond or back to Richmond, I decided I, I needed to add Kalman back to my name since this is where I'm from and people know Kalmans. Okay. I wanted to be connected to my family. <laughs> yes. So I use both names. Good choice. Yes. His his family were uh, his his grandfather changed it from Weinstein to Winston when he came here. Okay. Yeah. Yes, it, it sounds more anglicized. Yes. My brother took a middle name when we were naturalized, my twin, and he took the name of Robert because it sounded very American. And I didn't take any middle name. I'm just just Alex still. <laughs> That's it, yeah. Unfortunately, I was Alexander, who I was naturalized. I just shortened it to Alex. I don't know why I did that, and I regret that now. Huh. Yeah, you can, cha can change it again. <laughs> oh, when I was 14, I thought my name was some bitch. Get over here, some bitch. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what's the what's story about that? that um, that um, ro rotor behind you, not rotor, the airplane rotor. The way, the, the propeller? The propeller, that's what I'm trying to say, yeah. It came off of my airplane. Off your airplane? Yeah. I hope not while and you were flying. I have, well, that's the reason it came off. I, I owned a twin Comanche, which was a twin engine airplane. Okay. And after X number of hours, the tip of the propellers broke off. Oh it was not on mine, but on other ones, yeah. and it flew into the cockpit and killed the pilot. So the FAA came out with a directive that anybody that had a twin Comanche had X number of hours. We kept the logbook on the propellers, had to change the propellers. Oh. Well, our propellers were still good, but they were in that group of hours. So right. I had to take them off and put new propellers on from the factory. And when I did, I said, well, those are perfectly good propellers. I'll use them as a display. Yeah. So I, made, I brought them home and I made a display of one of them. I don't know where the other set is. It's, it's, it's good there. It, on your uh, the top of your beanie, it wouldn't have fit well. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm so excited to be with all of you for this Yom HaShoah program. And before we begin, let's all just take a moment to center ourselves. Take a breath in and out and really join this space and this time. Welcome to Eastern, Re Eastern Region's Zikaron Basaron a BBYO tradition of telling the story of survivors for future generations. My name is Claudia Sachs, and I am the 29th Virginia Council Shlicha from Richmond, Virginia. And my name is Maya Lapidot Boaz, and I was the 29th North Carolina Shlicha from Charlotte, North Carolina. Today, we will be honoring the story of of the inspiring Holocaust survivor, Jay Ibsen, and through the power of music and learning, we'll discuss the bright future of Jewish persistence in the fight against hatred. Thank you for joining us tonight. Today is Holocaust Remembrance Day, or Yom HaShoah in Hebrew. It is us to truly never forget the Holocaust, and as the younger generations, we must continue to learn and share the stories of the six million lives lost due to hatred, bigotry, and the apathy of bystanders. 
As you listen to the story of Jay Ibsen, a Holocaust survivor and youth activist from around the U.S., we invite you to stay present, keep your phone away, and try to turn on your camera if you're able so we can really build our community here together. After today, you will be the carrier of these stories for future generations. Together, we will tell this story. As we begin our journey of learning together, we will hear a beautiful violin piece by Donovan Williams, a Richmond advocate for combating racism and anti-Semitism. As you listen to him play, it's not difficult to hear the anguish and expression in every note. So many difficult stories and journeys can be found in this piece. Here is Donovan Williams. Williams from Collegiate School, and I'll be playing the Chrysler Recitativo for you today. Hope you enjoy. He's not. He's muted. Can't hear him. <laughs> Thank you so much, Donovan, for sharing that beautiful music with us, especially during this difficult time. Today, we'll, we will be hearing the incredibly important testimony of Jay Ibsen. Jay Ibsen is an incredible teacher, lecturer, and storyteller who's been sharing his story of captivity and liberation with people across the United States for many decades. 
We're so blessed to be with him in this community today. Thank you for joining us, Jay. Thank you, Claudia. Can an atrocity like the Holocaust happen here in the United States? We have 940 hate groups here in the United States right now, 37 of which are in Virginia. When the Nazi party was 44% of the German government, Hitler was appointed chancellor, similar to speaker of the house. And at that point, he started issuing orders. And one of the first orders was the Jews could not participate in colleges. They could not be lawyers. They could not sit on public benches. They could not go to movies, theaters. They could not go to certain institutions. They had to walk in the gutter in the street, wear a hat, and wear a star of, yellow Star of David on the front and back of their clothing. And then they, uh, whenever they passed a German, they had to tip their hat and say good afternoon, good evening, whatever the time was. So now Hitler's ambition was to take over the world, but he had to start somewhere. So he made a deal with Russia to divide Europe. The Russians would get half of it and come into part of Poland, and the Germans would come into the rest of it. And nobody did anything. The British government had a guy by the name of Chamberlain, and he said, there would be peace in our time. Nobody did anything, so the Russians came into Lithuania. I'm from Lithuania, and the Germans went into Poland and annexed them. When they went in, the Russians have a fantastic system. Everything that belongs to you belongs to them. My father was a lawyer, but Lithuania followed the laws of Germany just about. So he couldn't practice law. He went into the motorcycle business and we were quite successful. As soon as the Russians came into Lithuania, the first thing they did is come to our business and pick up all our motorcycles and bank account. And my father had to go to work for the Russians. At that time, I was six years old and Nobody uh, said anything to them. So Hitler figured he no longer needed the Russians. So he attacked the Russians because he wanted to take over all of that. And then he was going to go after England, the United States, as it was going to go on. So as the Germans started taking over, the Russians started escaping and we escaped with them, but we were cut off by paratroopers, German paratroopers told to go back. When we came back, a Lithuanian Catholic priest, slide, Jonas Jankuskas led his parishioners to kill the Jewish neighbors. We don't have time to go into everything, but ultimately he escaped to the United States and we found him in New Jersey and deported him back to Lithuania. Slide. His parishioners and our neighbors went to the rabbi's house and this guy that you see in the corner with a saw cut off the rabbi's head and paraded it through the streets like we do a Halloween pumpkin slide. On Wednesday, June 25th, 1941, they gathered a group of Jews from Kovna, Lithuania, took him to Letuki's garage and beat him to the ground. This picture was taken by a German photographer, slide. They gathered Jews together and took them to the ninth, uh, Sixth Fork, 
Lithuania had fortifications all around it to protect them from the Poles and the Russians. But our Lithuanian neighbors grabbed up a bunch of Jews under the watchful eye of the International Red Cross and executed them, men, women, and children. Slide. The Germans then came in and said, we're going to stop the massacre between the Lithuanians and the Jews, the Jews, uh, the Lithuanians killing the Jews, and we're going to put you into a barbed wire compound called the ghetto. So on July 10th, 1941, the Jews, and what you see with the armed bands here, are Jewish policemen, started building a ghetto. Slide. On October 28, 1941, uh, 28,000 Jews were herded out in a field known as uh, Democratic Square. And amongst those people was my family, my mother's family, including me. And a German sergeant went up to every one head of the family and ask Wasserdein Berufa Fluchter Jude, what is your profession, them Jew? If you were a doctor, a lawyer, a rabbi, a businessman, you and your whole family were sent to the left. If you were a garbage collector, a cobbler, a tailor, anybody that could work with the hands and all, were sent to the right. Rocker, the German sergeant, came over to my father. My father was a lawyer, a businessman. On the spare of the moment, he didn't know why, but he said right is better than left. So when Raka asked him, Wasserdein Barufa Fluchter Jude, what is your profession, damn Jew? He said, Ich bin ein Automobilmechaniker, I'm a car mechanic. He couldn't drive a nail straight. Raka told him, take his family and go home. The next morning, the, that night, excuse me, that night, 10,500 men, women, and children were executed on the ninth floor. 10,500 uh, children. Some of them that were left became orphans. Orphans were not allowed, slide. The ones on the ninth fort were executed between wood and buried on the field because of time. We skipped that slide and we're not going to show it. Uh, slide. The children that were left, the Jewish community took and hid them in a hospital and called it the contagious disease unit, figuring that the children would be able to survive. The Lithuanians and Germans found out that the children were hidden in a hospital. They came, they nailed the doors and windows shut, slide, and burned it to the ground. The next morning after that selection, my father was, uh, a, a German came to our house, said he's looking for the car mechanic. My father knew that it would be dangerous if he didn't fess up, the whole family would die. So he said he was the car mechanic. The German said, come with me. He took him to the airport and he took him into a shop and said, this is my vehicle that's broken. Can you fix it? My father spoke fluent German. He said, Natalia, certainly not a problem. He said, what seems to be the problem? The German says, you're the mechanic, you tell me. When I drive it, there's a banging underneath my seat. My father said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to lay down on the ground and you drive over top of me. Figuring if he drove over top of him and killed him, that's a chance he had to take. Otherwise, he would shoot him. So when he drove over top of him, my father realized that the universal joint was loose and it was knocking. He told the German, I see where the problem is, I will fix it. Now, he didn't know what kind of tools to ask for. So he went into the parts room and says, give me an adjustable wrench, just like what I'm wearing on my tie, 
And with that and his bare hands, he was able to fix it. The German got into vehicle, drove it a couple of blocks, said it's perfect. You're the finest mechanic I've ever seen. You will now be the shop foreman. So he goes to work at the airport and then they have another selection for children. And then they change, I was in that selection to be deported and they changed their mind and let us go home. They weren't satisfied with that. So then they came again, slide. Slide. This, this slide after the deportation. Uh, they weren't satisfied, so they were gonna deport 2,700 Jews from Kovna, Lithuania to Riga, Latvia. They started grabbing up the Jews. The one that you see now standing by the pole, that's my grandfather, to be deported. Mother and I and mother's whole family were also selected. Slide. That's me and my mother standing behind him. A Jewish policeman that was a friend of my father's recognized me, grabbed me and said, get on the other side of the fence and take mother with you. My mother didn't want to leave her family. I started crying. I said, I wanted to go to my father. So she followed me. We are the only two that survived. Everybody, 1,700 Jews, including my, family, my mother's whole family, were executed. Slide. Shortly thereafter, my father met a farmer that he had done some favors for when he was capable, before we, all this mess started. And the farmer told him that if we could escape, that he would take us to the country and try to save our lives. Well, you see that arrow on November 1943, my father cut the barbed wire and I was told to run across the street and hide until my mother could come to get me as the guard was walking back and forth in front of the spot that we escaped. I was hidden behind the fence and in the middle of the night, dark and cold, my mother came out when the guard made another round, was able to sneak out under the wire and cross the street. It was our neighborhood, so I was familiar with it. And by touching the ground, she found me. Now the word passed between us. And we hugged and waited what seemed like forever. And then my father came out. And after he came out, his cousin moved hooked the wire back so nobody knew that we escaped. And we walked five blocks, slide, where the farmer took us in his wagon. He hid me under a straw, a wagon full of straw. It was my first straw ride. And he took us to a hiding place, to a place another farmer, my mother's uncle was a farmer in summertime, she used to go to spend her summers with him. And he followed the Jewish tradition of not planting a piece of property, land, the seventh year. So he always had good crops and he would lend his farmers crops when they had a bad one seed to start up again. So he had some friends and mother knew some of them when she'd come to spend time with him. So one of those farmers were a Catholic Polish family that was so poor that their whole house was about the size of this uh, living room. And they had a dirt floor, a straw ceiling, an oven. Every time they lit it up to cook or warm themselves, smoke filled up half of the house a table and a bed, and a 16-year-old son. My father knew that it was dangerous for us to stay there. 
So we asked Mr. Paskowskas if perhaps he could use his potato hole in the woods to build us a hiding place. Now, my father wasn't a mechanic, he wasn't an engineer either. When he started digging with a stick and his hands, the whole place caved in on him. The farmer had a German shepherd known as Rexy. Rexy started running around and barking. He was our guardian. And Stashuk, the farmer's son, used to play fiddle at hoedowns. And he was happy to come down from a hoedown and he heard his bar dog barking. He knew there was a problem. He came running and he saw a hand sticking out from underneath the ground. He quickly opened up my father's face so he could breathe, went and got his parents, and together they dug my father out, saving his life. After that, Mr. Paskowskas, whenever he would chop down trees for his fire, he left pieces for my father to find so he could show up the hiding place. Ultimately, we moved into that hiding place. We were in there for six months, never changing clothes, never taking a bath, and starving. My father and ultimately we ended up with 13 people. My father cousins and their wives, my uncle's sister-in-law and her son, my uncle and his family, 13 of us lived in there for six months. My friends were mice and lice. During that whole time, I didn't have a bath. I didn't have a change of clothes. I crawled from one tunnel to the other one. My father was petrified that I would get the place and get it to cave in. We were afraid that at any moment that the Germans would come looking for us because we were not far from the woods where the partisans were. However, the Germans came with a half track with half a mile of trying to find us, but they're afraid to go further because the partisans would kill them. We stayed in there and the wood, I asked my father, the last thing, my father was always afraid I'd get hurt or get killed. So he never approved of anything I ever did, but he approved of my building the Holocaust Museum. So I asked him on his deathbed, you'd had no nails, you had no tools, how did you get the wood to stand up? And he told me that he took stalks from the wheat, made rope out of it, and with rope tied the pieces of wood together until he could take another piece to brace it up. And he was always petrified with my crawling back and forth that I would get the place to cave in. Fortunately, we survived. I didn't get it to cave in, but I was covered with lice. And that's how I learned how to count. Every morning or every evening, I would take between my thumbs and kill lice and count them and try to figure out every day. If I had a good day, I'd add. If I had a bad day, I would subtract. And my father taught me the multiplication and division table. In 1944, we were liberated by the Russians. We went back to our home and my father went to work for the Russians. Because he helped some Holocaust survivor women when they were coming back from the camps, 
he was declared an enemy of the Soviet Republic, which meant that by night, that was in the middle of the day, by nightfall, we would be picked up and shipped to Siberia. My father was riding a bicycle, he came home, he was prepared. The Russians let the Polish Jews, uh, Polish, go back to Poland. So mother and dad had, my mother's na maiden name was Wytrymowicz, which was Polish. So they had papers forged that we were Poles. He came home, told mother, grab a backpack, whatever you've got, we're leaving immediately, we've got to escape or they're gonna come by six o'clock and get us and ship us to Siberia. My mother had a backpack with some food, my father had some clothing and I had a blanket, or a down blanket, which is still on my bed today. And we escaped. He said, don't go on that ice. I said, oh, it's clear. And I, on a couple of pieces of wood, I skated out, broke through the ice and almost drowned. And to this day, I can remember that six year old boy, at that time, I think I was nine, no, I was 10. That six year old boy said to me in Russian, give me your hand. And miraculously, it was God's will. I gave him my hand and he was able to pull me above the ice and we ran home. And as soon as we got in that house, they took off my clothes and covered me with hot fluid. And I survived without even catching a cold. Then we escaped to Poland and from Poland we escaped to Checkpoint Charlie, to the American, uh, to the uh, French zone, from the French zone to the American zone. And there my father worked for the American Joint Distribution Committee in Munich and Ben-Gurion came to him and he had to give him a vehicle and together they went to the Nuremberg trials and the two of them slept in the same bed in Nuremberg because there were no rooms to sleep. It's a long story, too long to go in. And uh, we uh, ultimately got papers to come to the United States. On June 12th, uh, my birthday was June 5th. And on June 12th, we came to the United States here to Richmond. And then in September, they, my aunt took me to school and at, at Lee School, and they looked at me and said, huh, you need to be in the sixth grade. And I started school in the sixth grade without any prior education. I was good in math because I counted lice, and my father taught me division and multiplication while we were in the hole. They didn't, I didn't need to take a foreign language because I spoke six of them. But guess what? Every year I flunked English. I had to go to summer school. And after I went to summer school, I'd go back to the teacher that flunked me. I'd show her that I could spell two extra words and she'd pass me on up. So I think my time is up. And uh, if you got questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you so much for sharing that inspiring story. We were also moved by your words and experiences. At this time, if anyone has any questions, please chat Claudia or I, and we will only share two of them because of time constraints. Um, so if you have questions, please message, message us at this time.
We have one great question from somebody I know named Roberta Oster. And the question is for Jay, what can people do today to stop anti-Semitism? The best thing that we can possibly do is go to the polls and elect a president that understands what this is all about. Unfortunately, during the Holocaust, the United States had presidents that did not care about the Jews. And anti-Semitism was ripe then. Unfortunately, anti-Semitism is getting a good start right now because our country is divided. And right now, in the state of Virginia, they're trying to do the exact same thing as they did to us in Europe. Jews were not allowed to own guns. Consequently, we could not defend ourselves. And that's a terrible thing. The Second Amendment gives us the right to own a weapon and to defend ourselves. Originally, it was to defend ourselves against the British. But I just told you a little while ago, there are 940 hate groups, groups. That's thousands of people that hate, and a lot of them hate Jews. And the first thing they do whenever something bad happens to the country, they say the Jews did it. Right now, we've got a virus epidemic going around, and there are groups that blame the Jews that we did it, even though we well know Israel has just uh, got a message today, found a cure or a shot that in two months is going to be released. It's patented for stopping this epidemic. But yet the Jews are being blamed for everything, including some members of our government. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Jay. Um, we're going to, I know we said two questions, but we're going to move on with the program. And if we have extra time at the end, I cannot wait to hear all of your great questions. I know this is a really motivated and smart audience. Um, after 75 years after the atrocity of the Holocaust, the virus of anti-Semitism is still present in the world, just as Jay was just saying. And today we have to stand up against anti-Semitism and all forms of hatred in every country and every city. Today we'll hear the testimony of two teen leaders who are currently speaking out and using their voices to bring an end to anti-Semitism and to make sure that we never forget. Abby Adams, a teen from Charlotte, North Carolina, is spreading the stories of Jewish pride and persistence through her initiative of Why I Wear My Star. And Sid Hammerman from Dallas, Texas, founded the BBYO Genocide Education Committee to lobby for Holocaust education around the world. Thank you both for coming on and speaking today. Hi, I'm so glad uh, to get to speak and to hear um, your incredible testimony. Um, a friend and I, about a year ago, started an initiative called Why I Wear My Star. And our goal of this initiative is to share stories of Jewish pride and persistence, just like um, Mr. Ibsen did today. And so on Instagram and Facebook, we are helping share people's stories of things that they've overcome and why they're proud to be Jewish. Um, and our hope is just to create a better environment where we're more comfortable to speak up about these things. And so I encourage all of you, if you feel comfortable to, to share your stories with us. Thank you for sharing, Abby. It's so great to have you here. And our next teen activist is Sid Hammerman from Dallas, Texas, who has shared a video of her story with us. And I'm one of the co-founders and 
Hello everyone, my name is Sid Hammerman and I am a high school junior from Houston, Texas, which is Lone Star Region and DPYO, and I'm one of the co-founders and co-chairs of the Genocide Education Committee. They started off as a small idea at Perlman. After Barack Reedman and I attended a Hugim session, which is an activity session um, all about the memory of the Holocaust, we were inspired to take action. Thus, we created the Genocide Education Committee. It's an ILM committee that's completely grassroots, run by teens and teens only. Our original um, purpose for the G for GEC was to have the teens mobilize. Leave my lips. Um, lives and such, um, but uh, I am so humbled by all of the programs that have happened this weekend. We really only expected there to be about 20, and there were easily 40 to 50 from countries all over the world, and. It's just so moving to know that there are so many teens and so many people around the world that really do care about remembering and properly honoring the victims of the Holocaust. Um, it's super easy to get involved. Um, if you want to email uh, bbyogenocideeducation at gmail.com or text me at 832-538-2615, um, you can totally get involved and uh, we can start working on whatever project you're interested in. Thank you. Hello. Thank you to Sid and Avi for sharing your stories. If you're interested in getting involved, you can contact me or Maya and we will get you set up um, to continue your journey of activism that you've already started by being on this call today. So in this next part of our program, I'll be sharing a song that I wrote with all of you. And I wrote this song at BBYO Kala, which was a summer camp I attended last summer. And they have a weekend called Shabbat to Remember, which is when they bring in 10 Holocaust survivors from all over the country to share their stories with 200 teens from 30 countries. And during that weekend, as I listened to the survivors' testimonies, I took notes on quotes that they said, and the lyrics of this song are direct quotes, most of them are direct quotes from the survivors' testimonies. So this song is called Living History, and Living History was a quote by Sammy, St Sammy Steigman, a survivor who told us about how he felt this duty and obligation to share his story. They said they were taking us to work, but none of them were really sure. We were patched with yellow on our streets, chains of hate dragged on our feet. I am what I choose to be, dear God, I choose to be free. I tolerate a lot of pain, still my life won't be in vain. Oh, oh, I stand as never forget my story I stand as living history please keep our people free I knew I had 
glad to be different because indifference makes the heart thicken after living in dark and fear i share my story every year i stand as living history please never forget my story i stand as living history Please tell the world my story. I stand as living history. Please keep our people free. So dear future children, take a moment to listen. I stand as living history please tell the world my story i stand as living history please never forget my story i stand as living history please keep our people free you can join me in the chorus from wherever you are i stand as living history please tell I stand as living history, please never forget my story. I stand as living history, please keep our people free. Please keep our people free. Now that we've all heard the story of Jay's survival and the messages from inspiring youth activists, it is our responsibility to share his testimony, learn the stories of all the survivors who are with us, stand up against anti-Semitism wherever you see it, um, combat all forms of hatred and bigotry, and pass on the torch of learning and history to your community. What concrete actions can you take to combat anti-Semitism after this call? You can write to your legislators calling for Holocaust education in your state. You can write articles and share your stories or experiences with hatred or bigotry. And you can learn to, you can learn to listen, you can listen to the stories of survivors online and in person. And you can tell the story you learned tonight. We invite every person on this call to now drop us a message in the chat of one thing you will commit to doing this month to combat anti-Semitism in your community. The chat feature is at the bottom of your screen. You can also write your response in, on a piece of paper and hold it up to the screen. I also just changed the settings so now you can unmute yourself if you'd like to share what you will do. We can re-enable the chat. I see Sam says educate. I really like that answer. Sasha says create more lessons against hate for my students. The chat is also open now. We have advocate for immigrants and advocate in general. Listen and retell stories. Support BBYO as you continue to do great things to combat hate and educate others. One of the important thing is, is for you to talk to your neighbors, the closest ones to you, get a message to them ask them to pass on the message to the children and the pastors and the rabbis. That's how the message gets across. Yad Vashem in Jerusalem has a program and one of the 
leaders that's in charge of all the United States is right here, Reverend Jenkins at River Road Baptist Church. Grove and Avenue. he's Grove Avenue. Grove Avenue, I'm sorry, Grove Avenue Baptist Church. And he leads groups of Christians to Yad Vashem in Jerusalem continuously. And we need to educate. There are a lot of good people out there that don't know. We need to educate them. And they don't have to be of the Jewish faith. We need to educate those that are not of the Jewish faith. And it's also important to educate those of the Jewish faith because we've got a lot of young people. BBYO is an exceptional organization. You guys do a fantastic job, I know, because I was a BBYO member when I came here in 1947 and couldn't speak English. But we need to educate our neighbors. And if you get your message out to our neighbors and they get out the message to their neighbors, we need to be good neighbors and we need to teach those that aren't how to be good neighbors. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Um, to continue on that beautiful message, we also have that uh, Marissa is committing to getting involved with the Genocide Education Committee. You can text me, I'll give you Sid's info. Um, Roberta says, ask teachers to talk about the Holocaust in school. Um, Alex says, teach the Holocaust, teaching the Holocaust will mitigate anti-Semitism. Like a man pushing a heavy wheelbarrow up a steep incline, if he stops pushing the barrow, it will slide backwards onward. Um, thank you, Alex. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to share? Write poems and songs. Interview survivors. We have six minutes left. We have to be off at seven o'clock, but we have time for one more question for Jay um, to wrap up our really incredible evening tonight. So we can look at the ones from earlier. Somebody had something at the bottom of the screen, but I couldn't understand. You need to talk with your teachers. Your teachers are conduit. And if they get interested in what you need to teach, they will pass it on to their teachers, their principals, and they will make the schools a better place to learn. We learn hate in school because we've got bullies. And we've got to learn how to handle the bullies. And the kids that are being bullied need to be taught how to defend themselves. I've talked to many a child and told them how to handle a bully. When I came to the United States, I, had, I was bullied the first day I came to school. And I had to handle the situation by myself because I had nobody to handle it for me. And running away from a bully is not a solution. You need to look at the bully square in the eye and tell him, words are not going to hurt me. And if they lay a hand on you, then you've got a teacher to stand up for you. So we need to teach the students not to accept bullying from bullies. Because bullies learn it at home. And if you teach the bully a lesson, then they will take it home to their parents, or at least when they grow up, they're not going to be bullies. Do you have any final thoughts for us, Jay? There's a lot of <laughs> BBYO teens here who are under 18, who might be 18. Um, so what do you have a message for the youth of this call, especially as we carry on your story to our friends and networks? You need to get involved in politics. Don't get involved in party politics. Get involved and know who the politician is and what they stand for. 
I have voted at times for the Democrats. I voted at times for the Republicans. But I've never missed an election. And if you miss an election, it's your fault. I'll vote for dog catcher because if I don't and get a cat catcher, it's my fault. So we need to vote. I also, when I turned 18, I joined the military. We need to have a strong army. Learn a lot of good lessons in the military. You'll also get bullied in the military because that's where some bullies are. So you got to learn how to handle them. And a good education is priceless. Unfortunately, I've also run into colleges where the professors don't know what they're teaching. Consequently, we've got professors that help educate or try to lead people to things that are totally wrong without following up and nobody follows up. But there are some people and we do follow up on some professors when they teach the wrong stuff. And there have been books for school in Texas that had wrong information in them because the people that wrote the lessons in those books didn't know the facts. And you guys have a big responsibility. You know the facts. And you need to teach the teacher if they're wrong, or if you see something wrong in a book and can prove it wrong, you need to bring it to the education committee or to somebody to get those pages out of that book. Thank you so much, Jay, for sharing your story with all of us here today. Um, at the earlier part of our call, there were almost 30 people. So if you do that math, if each of you share your story, that Jay's story with one person, we have 60 people in the world who know this story. Double that, we have 120, 180. My math will die after that. But the point is that it's an exponential growth of numbers and of stories and an end to hatred and that is all coming from Jay Ibsen here on our call today. Um, so don't just hang up this call and go about your life. Make sure that after this call you are actively combating anti-Semitism, you're hearing the stories of the survivors that are with us and continuing to end hatred across the world. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Thank Jay. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.